Welcome in to First Draft, just five weeks away from the 2024 NFL Draft. He's Mel Kuyper Jr. I am in Field Gates. I am, I think, doing the show from the third different state since we started this season of First Draft, Mel. That's got to be some sort of record here for this whole podcast. And I have not. So you'd have to have one would beat me. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> you know where I am all the time, right at the yes. compound. So you guys are all over the country with your pro days and you're doing this and you're skiing and you're doing all that stuff. So having fun. I'm just here trying to figure it all out. Yeah, this is the life with two children that I must lead right now, two young children at that. But we've got important draft business to take care of here today, Mel, as just a couple of days ago, Tuesday to be specific, mock. 3.0 drop. This one was a banger as always. Just one round, Mel. We'll get to two rounds and trades and all that at later dates. We're going to go right through it, Mel, and dive into it. And I think what we're going to do is kind of how we've done it in the past, which is sort of taking five-ish picks at a time and kind of finding what is interesting, what was difficult for you. But before we get into the specific picks, were there any challenges that were different this time as opposed to the first couple of times you did this year's mock draft? Yeah, the free agency it really clouds everything because you try to anticipate what you're hearing, but you don't know what's going to happen with what has happened field and what could happen and how needs have changed or needs were created. And then you get into the Jets and then you hear the Giants. Yeah. Do they take a quarterback? Do they take the receiver? What do the Jets do? They go receiver now that they have Mike Williams or do they do offense to line, even though they've gone out and tried to really uh, solidify that group with some trade, the trade up for Morgan Moses and the signing. So those things complicated field. What I found myself seeing was two to three areas they could address. And I had players sitting there for them. And I had to try to figure out which one made the most sense and who would maybe wait till the second, third round if there was some depth at that position. So it was tricky with a lot of teams, but I think the Jets and the Giants were really difficult because I almost – We'll get to what I almost did in a minute. Yeah, so Mel, by the way, my next mock is about it's th 13 days from right now. Mock 2.0 for me. It'll be a two-rounder comes out. And along the lines of what you just discussed with free agency, and I have not finished it. I'm not close to finishing it. But I just, I started to, to sort of scribble down some names and some picks. And what I have found to be the hardest part about mocks now is, mm -hmm. and we'll bring this up throughout a few of your picks in this most recent mock draft, is mm -hmm. a team does something in free agency that takes care of a need on a short-term basis. Right. But is that good enough to cross off that need entirely for the first round? We'll dive into specific examples of that throughout this exercise. But that's one thing that I am juggling now as I get ready to forecast Mach 2.0. But let's go to the first five picks here, Mel. And there are not <coughs> a ton of surprises. Three quarterbacks to start the proceedings. Caleb Williams, of course, goes to the Chicago Bears. They have now traded Justin Fields, Jaden Daniels goes to the Commanders. No change there. Drake May goes to the Patriots to pick three. And then Mel, back-to-back -back receivers, Malik, excuse me, Marvin Harrison Jr., perhaps a Freudian slip right there by me, and Malik Neighbors from LSU going to the Chargers. Let's just quickly address the Bears, Mel. We have some clarity. Are we at the point now where we're putting Caleb Williams to the Chicago Bears in pen in your mind? I believe we are, Field. I really do. I don't think it's any doubt that this is the thing. When Ryan Poles was at Kansas City, he was the director of college scouting when they drafted Patrick Mahomes. Yep. Who do we always comp? Who do we always say reminds us of Patrick was Caleb Jesus. Williams. Now, Caleb Williams in 2022 had an offensive line. He had a Jordan Addison. He didn't have Addison. He didn't have the offensive line. So in 2023, we saw from the Notre Dame game on, things went a little awry there. So some red flags there. But when he had some help, it was outstanding. So if you're phenomenal in one year and then you drop back a little bit in two or three games, you can't condemn a player for that. And then you can't move a player off that number one spot for that. So for me, and Drake May didn't do enough to, to challenge, and he may have not done enough field to hold off J.J. McCarthy for that Ooh. third quarterback spot. So I'm yeah. locked in. Caleb Williams, I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind that this is going to be the pick. Now, I would have kept Justin Fields. I would not have given him away. That was, to me, a, a gift to the Steelers, which they gave a gift on the Joey Porter Chase Claypool. They gave him another gift. They like gifting things to the Steelers for some reason. But right now, it's definitely Caleb Williams all the way. Okay, so we have the three quarterbacks at the top. Before we get to the two receivers, Mel, you did bring something up. And I believe at this point of the process, absent something like an injury or something off-field related right. – there's not a whole lot that players at the very top of the board can do to change my mind, right? There's tons of film on these guys. We've held these players in very high estimations for a long time. The reason I mention that is 
no matter what the buzz might be, I am firmly in the minds uh, of, of the mind that Drake May is a superior prospect to J.J. McCarthy. Just to get you on the record, do you feel that way as well, despite where it seems like some in the league might be drifting towards where it's a conversation between those two players? Do you still see a gap? Not a huge gap at all, Field. I think there's going to be some that think J.J. McCarthy is better than Drake May. I know there are. I'll tell you why. What happens after the season's over? Who gets most involved in the process? Coaches, Coaches. yeah. Yeah. Coaches who haven't seen these guys, haven't thought about these guys, know nothing about these guys until the season's over, right? So they all get involved. Coordinators, quarterback coaches, everybody gets involved. And the coaches in the National Football League will love J.J. McCarthy. And then yeah. what do they do? They go to Combine, and they sit down with J.J. And he will yeah. wow you over, right? And then athletically, he'll test great. And he won all those games. He has He fits every... Checks every box, fits every criteria the coaches want in an NFL quarterback, okay? And you got Jim Harbaugh saying, hey, I'd take him if I had the number one pick in a draft that I needed a quarterback. He's the best player in the draft. And he played yeah. in a pro style. Andrew Luck played in this offense field. Remember that? Every yeah. quarterback. Colin Kaepernick looked great for Jim Harbaugh, right? So when you think about where we are right now with J.J. McCarthy, he benefited from, we said it was going to hurt him by not having to do it. Look, I did Fourth quarter, Field, think about this. In the fourth quarter of all the games this year, right, J.J. was 24 of 34 mm. for 293 yards. That's a game for a lot of people or less than a game, right? That was yeah. just the fourth quarter of all the games. 70%, one touchdown, no picks. I one touchdown. Was- yeah. All right. So again, he wasn't asked to carry this football team, but he did oh, his yes, job. So. And I, th- I, I really think right now, Field, that Drake May is, is there's some doubt as to whether he can be. I think there's that boomer bust with Drake May right now in some yes. people's mind because he has that longer delivery than people really prefer. He had the struggles against some mediocre teams. He missed open receivers when he had time to throw. He wasn't precise with some throws. There's a lot to like. I'm not here killing Drake May, but I'm just saying there's a reason why J.J. McCarthy in some people's minds has legitimately overtaken Drake May. Okay, so – if it, that may have happened in other people's minds, I just want to make very clear here, it's Thursday, March 21st, a little before 11 a.m. Eastern time now, that I still see it very clearly as Drake May, a superior prospect going into this process than J.J. McCarthy. I get it. There are some things that Drake needs to clean up. I'd still bet big on the upside of Drake May. That kid's got a lot of tools, and I'm starting to wonder if maybe people have overthought it. I'm not talking about you. Maybe people in the NFL have overthought it a little bit with Drake May. Don't let You're a scout. You're a scout, Field. You're a scout. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mel. I appreciate that's that. That's the way sc- scouts will do that. Scouts will project, right? Yep. Scouts will look past certain things, see certain things, and say, I can see that translating to the NFL. Yep. Coaches are all about the moment. They see yeah. what they want to see. They always think, oh, I see a lot of this and that. I, what I need him to do, he does. Uh, they're into the – then the intangibles come into it. Who well – so I, I think for me, you're more – there's more of a gap for you than me. So I, yes, I'm not going to be is. swayed by – my ratings are my ratings. But the right. gap has closed a little bit because I didn't want to have Drake May – so far ahead of J.J. McCarthy that it's like you know, really love one, but you just, you're just you okay. I always said all along that J.J. was a wild card. We could never figure him out. Right. doesn't mean that he's not going to be great. That means he's going to be a bust. But when you really look at it, you can see, and I, I think the national title game, I wouldn't say it convinced me that he can be pretty doggone good, but when he needed to make plays, and guess what? His margin for error you know about other guys are throwing it all over. They, they throw a couple incomplete passes. Who the heck cares, Field? He couldn't do that. Yeah, you know, he had no margin for error, and then he had guys dropping balls when he needed to make plays. He did. Uh, I tell you what, he was unflappable, and he was under pressure, and he was under pre- he, that Alabama game looked like Alabama was going to beat Michigan, so it looked like they weren't going to survive yeah. the semifinal game. So for me, I, I like the moxie, I guess, of JJ. And I think, yeah. I think that's when it's going to take him a long way. And the coaching he received there and the fact that he was in an NFL style, an NFL situation week in and week sure. out, he, despite them having superior personnel and winning a national title, not throwing yeah. a pass against Penn State in the second half, that could maybe work to benefit him in the National Football League.
Yeah, so I just like in a vacuum, I would prefer Drake May to J.J. McCarthy. I will say this. I'm not trying to speak out of both sides of my mouth, Mel, but if Drake May goes to the Patriots to pick three, and the Vikings move up and acquire J.J. McCarthy, and he has Justin Jefferson and eventually a healthy T.J. Hawkinson and two outstanding offensive tackles and Jordan Addison and Aaron Jones in the backfield, then J.J. McCarthy might well have a much better start to his career than Drake May because if Drake May goes to the Patriots, as things presently stand, his number one wide receiver is, I don't know, Juju Smith-Schuster, Pop Douglas. Is it, I mean, it's Kendrick Bourne coming off of an ACL tear? Or is it, I don't know, Mel. That, that's the, it, is, it, is it KJ Osborne, former Minnesota Viking? So um, I'm evaluating these two as prospects, not necessarily as to how their rookie seasons will look. But I just want to make clear, I'm still team Drake May, clearly in that top three for quarterbacks for me. Uh, let's rip through some more picks here, Mel, and then we'll discuss a few of these next seven or eight picks. Let's start with pick six. The Giants get Roma Dunze, Washington wide receiver. Absolutely love it. Titans get Joe Alt from Notre Dame, left tackle. Talk about the board falling how they would want. Same goes for Atlanta, Dallas Turner, Edge from Alabama. And then I want to get the four picks in a row, Mel, that I think are pretty interesting. The Bears okay. go Jared Verse, defensive end from Florida State. The Jets go Brock Bowers. I know you want to dive in on this one, so I'll give you plenty of space on that one. And then we get to the Vikings with J.J. McCarthy and the Broncos with Bo Nick. So back-to-back quarterbacks. Five in the top 12, but we'll start, and maybe we can be quicker on the Bears here, Mel. Uh, is this one where if you had a trade available to make, you would have done so for Ryan Poles and the Bears by moving back a handful of slots? thousand percent. Trading back yeah. is the right thing to do here. You can get Verse, you can get Latu, you can get Chop Robinson by moving down. You don't have to lock right. into a pass rusher at nine. One of the receivers are there, you take them, you don't move down. This is contingent upon who's there. If the right yeah. guy's not there, I mean, they don't have a two. They want to recoup the two they lost from Montez Sweat, which was a great trade, but they want to sure. get that two back. The way to do it is let somebody jump in the nine. Move down. You're in a good spot. You're really in a good spot because you've now, because of what the moves you've made field, and a lot of teams have done this, they've forced, they put themselves in a position where they don't have to force a player at a position. So for me, if I'm the Bears, I'm moving off a of nine. I'm going to get that second round pick back, and I'm going to take – probably field a pass rusher to work opposite Monta. I say probably because there's a couple other directions they could go, but probably take one of those three players I mentioned want to move down. Yeah, I would agree, Males. Uh, I, I'm not saying that if they end up taking one of those pass rushers at pick nine, it's a massive reach, but relative to the board, I do think there is an opportunity to move down, acquire a few right. picks, and draft a Jared Verse a little closer to where both you and I have them evaluated on the overall big board. All right, pick 10. This is fascinating, Mel. The Jets, as you mentioned, signed Tyron Smith. They traded for Morgan Moses. Now they signed Mike Williams. All of a sudden, this offense on paper looks like it's coming together, but those are three players, either because of age, health, or both, who to me are still risky inherently, right? There's part of the reason why those guys, in the case of Mike Williams and also Tyron Smith, were signed to one-year deals with lots of upside. Would you be taking an offensive tackle if you're the Jets right now, or what are you doing if you're Joe Douglas in this seat with pick 10? That's the tough one, Phil, because you've talked about the injury durability concerns of the players they brought in, and the ones they even have with Elijah Vera Tucker, then Morgan Moses, then Tyron Smith, then yeah. Mike Williams. Okay, can you keep these guys on the football field, right? Now, do you want an insurance policy on the offensive line? Do you want another receiver? If you're Aaron Rodgers, I would want Brock Bowers, but I also want to be able to get the ball to those guys. So I got to be upright and I can't, I'm coming off an Achilles and I'm you know, 40 years old. So do you want that insurance policy, that sixth offensive lineman, whether it's JC Latham, Troy Fautanu, uh, yeah. one of those, somebody like that, that has versatility, that if somebody does get hurt, which these guys have had a history of that, I can fill in those spots? Or do I want to add to Garrett Wilson? Mike Williams, and now bring in Brock Bowers, knowing that Mike Williams has had his injury issues too, right? So for me, Brock Bowers is a sixth, seventh best player on my board. We're at 10. I'm taking Brock Bowers. And I, and there, I will take an offensive lineman at some point as an insurance policy down the line. Okay, you can find those interior guys. Vera Tucker can flip back outside if you have to, right? So you have some versatility there with him where you can get to the third, fourth round and maybe find one of those guys. If Bowers is there, Based on what I've seen and what I know and how I feel about Bowers, that's my pick. 
Yeah, Mel, it's an interesting one because I don't want to totally hammer this dynamic too much. But I don't think it's the only thing that matters when these GMs and coaches are discussing the picks at number 10 overall, the potential options. But we've discussed this before in various different platforms, the idea that Joe Douglas and Robert Sala know it's now or never, right? If they don't win big this year, they might not be in the exact seat that they are in at this moment. So Brock Bowers is probably the least risky of the picks that we have discussed, right? You know Brock Bowers is going to be a really good player, when he's healthy and on the field. He has shown that during his Georgia career. And while, you know, the Jets got a little bit out of Tyler, he was a solid player last year, Tyler Conklin. The reality is, in terms of, you use that word fear factor players on that Jets offense in the passing game. They've got Garrett Wilson. They've got Brees Hall out of the backfield. Mike Williams, if he can stay healthy and on the field, would qualify on that fear factor list. But you got to keep going. When you play in a division with Josh Allen, you play in a division with the Dolphins offense and Tua Tungavailoa, who, by the way, led the NFL in passing yards last season with Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell and anybody else they might add this offseason. You play in a conference with Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. The list goes on. CJ Stroud and the list goes on and on and on. You got to find ways to win some track meets every once in a while. So while I would still personally be very, very tempted by an offensive tackle here, I think there's a chance that the narrative or the dynamic that these men need to win might prevail and taking Brock Bowers gives you that chance to win big and have an immediate impact let's go to 11 to JJ McCarthy as I mentioned here we can do sort of a two-for-one special now back-to-back quarterbacks do you think that JJ McCarthy actually lasts until pick 11 or would he have been much higher up your board if trades were allowed yeah, trades distort your draft board and dra- distort every mock draft field because you don't know what am I going to – if I was going to project a trade, what am I going to do? Yeah. Who am I going to go to five? Five doesn't guarantee you anything. Four, is Arizona going to trade out? At three, if they move up to three, I'm talking about Minnesota here, do they yeah. take Drake May, which you keep hearing it could be Drake May, or do they yeah. take J.J. McCarthy? I wouldn't even know who to give them there. You keep hearing Drake May, okay? That's yeah. what you hear from Minnesota. So if they do move up from 11 and 23 to three – the thing there is, New England, who needs a quarterback with Sam Darnold, they have Brissett as much as Minnesota does, right? Yeah. And New England, sitting there in that division, they're going to take themselves out of the, the May-McCarthy situation and move out of there, and then maybe look at Bo Nix or Michael Penix Jr. or whoever, right? And in, in the second, third, fourth round, I don't know who they like down the line, but they got to get a quarterback. Who are they going to get if they take themselves out of three? Now, it could be Penix or Nix. Bottom line is it's going to be really interesting to see. And I said this yesterday, most fascinating draft in 46 years for me. Because this is a make or break. You mentioned the Jets either win or you're gone, right? This is a a decision for both Minnesota and particularly New England because they hold all the cards field. They're there at three. They got a quarterback in their lap, right? Somebody's going to be there at three, okay? We know Caleb's going one. Yep. Jaden probably two, although something Drake may – if Jaden's there at three, you go on up and get him. Is New England going to pass on Jaden Daniels? I don't think so. I'd be surprised, wouldn't you? I'd be surprised at least. But this is the beauty of the NFL but draft. Guess what? Field, would, if yeah. Minnesota and New England, how they deal with this quarterback need that they both have yeah. equally as much, is going to determine their fate for a long, long time. Okay, no and we know. And I've said all along: if you don't believe in these quarterbacks, you don't draft them. So you don't have to take a quarterback just because I say it. You say, hey, the old Bill Tobin, out of Kuiper says, I don't we have to do what Kuiper says. You don't. If you don't yeah. love the player, and I'm talking about whoever that third quarterback is, right? If you don't love the third, you don't love the fourth, and you only like one and two, and they're gone, then you do get out of there and let the other team take the quarterback that you don't really like. And then you yeah. see how it plays out in three in a, in a couple of years, right? And in the NFL, it plays out in about a year now, right? So let right. it all play. Right. But this is going to determine the fate of a couple organizations at one move. There's no two ways about it, Mel. It's part of why this draft is so, so fascinating. The fact that you have potentially five quarterbacks in play in the top 12. So just to sort of put a pin in this 11-12 run here, Bo Nix, Denver Broncos, you know, we talked about this after the Oregon Pro Day and just the idea that Bo Nix, processing specialist, excellent accuracy. Um, Gosh, I don't even know if I want to say what we have both used reference-wise in regards to Bo Nix because everything becomes so hyperbolic these days. But you and I in different platforms have talked about how if you squint hard, 
there are elements of Bo Nix's game that align with what Drew Brees was a specialist in, right? Neither of these guys are going to be confused for Josh Allen in terms of arm strength, right? But Bo Nix, terrific accuracy, very good touch, very good placement, very good processor. And Sean Payton got I mean, it was an incredible run. Certainly Drew Brees, a primary factor for that. But those two working together, you could see some of that, not to the level of Drew Brees, of course, but you could see how Sean Payton would be drawn to a player like Bo Nix in terms of what he brings to the table. The amount of starts, Field, the amount of starts that's big was big for Bill Parcells. It'll be big for Sean Payton, Auburn and Oregon, a ton of starts for Bo Nix. The lack of arms, great arm strength didn't matter for Drew Brees. That's why I went in the second round. That's why Bo yep. Nix, we, you know, you say, okay, what's he lacking? Well, a little arm strength, but you don't need the Howard sort of be successful in this league. And then he's 24 years of age. He's a wow you over in an interview, smart, classy, professional, everything you want there in your CEO of your organization. He can move. He can beat you with his legs. He had 20 rushing touchdowns the last two years. Okay. So for Bo Nix, and you talk about divisions. If you're in the ASC and you got nothing, you got Jared Stidham. Yeah. Jared Stidham is, is who you're counting on, and you're in a division with Mahomes and Herbert. You got to roll the dice on a quarterback. And I do think, and I don't, I don't think you have to squint hard. I, I think Bo Nix. I did the numbers. Hand size, even exactly the same for Bo Nix and Drew Brees. Crazy. One was six yeah. foot and a half. One six two. They were both about two fourteen, two fifteen. Bo Nix and Drew Brees. You put them together. You don't have to squint. It's yeah. there. It's plain as day. I, yeah, I just I, I almost use it as a, a protective mechanism for the kids themselves now because I just feel bad when these kids are compared to Hall of Fame level athletes. And that's if they what don't, cops meet, are, field. That's I know. I'm telling I you, know. Matt Miller sells everybody's a comp. Have you ever heard of a first round comp to a mediocre player? No, 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 none of these quarterbacks are being compared to Andy Dalton or Derek Carr or somebody like that. Where, by the way, those guys have, have had really solid careers. I mean, certainly, be, especially as, as second-round picks, right? So you're right. It's, it's just the way, the nature of how these uh, comps work. I'm just maybe trying to offer comps with a bit of a measured taste as well. No, but, you, uh, they're fun to do. They just don't make they, any they sense are fun. to me. Yeah. They, they, yeah. Do they ever play out? Have you ever had a comp field that five years uh, down the road you say, man, I nailed that comp? Maybe you did, but you had 100 uh, of them, so you pick one out of the 100, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. That's right. That's right. A blind squirrel every once in a while finds yep. a nut now. Yep. So let's move on from the first 12 picks. We'll rip through a bunch here. Over the next six selections, the, uh, the Raiders take J.C. Latham, offensive tackle from Alabama. Mm -hmm. The Saints take uh, uh, Olu Fashionu from yep. Penn State, left tackle, also a very good player. The Colts go with Quinion Mitchell, first cornerback off the board. I'll ask you about that in just a moment. The Seahawks keep it local. They draft Troy Fautanu from Washington, very versatile and very talented player. Mm -hmm. And the Jaguars take Teron Arnold from Alabama, second cornerback off the board. And then finally, the Bengals take Tali Fuaga, who – uh, before this, or excuse me, after this mock draft came out, Mel, yeah. the team did yeah. sign Trent Brown to yes, a one-year deal. <laughs> but, you know, Mel, like, that was what I was getting at in the intro is that I don't know that Trent Brown, a player who has a lot of talent but has not always been particularly reliable, is enough to deter me from addressing a major need when I've got a, what, 27-year-old Joe Burrow and nothing is more important to me than keeping Joe upright we learned that the hard way last season when he got hurt and that team obviously uh, did not make the playoffs. They were nine and eight, but still not the same level of franchise without Joe Burrow on the field. But the player I wanted to ask you about in those six male was Quinion Mitchell. We both love the player. Uh, was it hard between him and Terry and Arnold to put Mitchell as cornerback one? Because for a few different conversations, we have certainly believed that Arnold has a very strong case to be that first corner taken. You know, what do you do? I think feel when you have two players that are pretty equal, you look at the numbers and I yeah. go to four, three, three, four, five. You know, I, yeah. that's what I look at. And that's the separation. If there, if you can't figure it out you got to go. And that's the ultimate thing. When you look at the NFL is in the at Toledo, he was great. Yep. Senior bowl week. You're down in mobile. I'm watching it. He looked great. Right. Yep. He did combine workout. He looked great. He's strong. He'll tackle. He's got length. He's got the speed. He's got everything you want. Okay. So I would go with Quinian Mitchell for the for CB1. Terry and Arnold, I think, falls into that next group, and Jacksonville certainly could take a corner. We know that. And then it gets into do you have Wiggins, DeGene? Where do you go after that? But I do think Quinian Mitchell right now is the consensus number one corner in this draft. Yeah. Last week, oh, excuse me, last year, Mel, the uh, Colts used a second round pick on Julius Brents from yep. Kansas State. 
bigger corner, nearly six foot three, but he also ran a four, five plus 40. So if I'm thinking about that Colts secondary, not that you need to have exclusively four, three guys, but if your top two perimeter corners are both four or five guys, that might leave you a little bit more vulnerable when you face off against those speedy wide receivers that we often see around and the NFL. And it would not shock me field at all. If Quinion Mitchell was taken before this pick corners yeah. with that kind of skill set that plays hey, that don't well, last, right? I mean, the scouts loved him. The coaches had to love him because he yep. did it right during the season. He did it right after the season. So yep. corner to test that well and played that well could go earlier than that particular pick. And guess what? Yeah. You keep hearing, is Brock Bowers going to be around here for the Colts? Yeah, uh, man. How about that, Mel? I know, I know. But this goes, I mean, this goes all the way back to Mach 1.0. I was having a hard time finding a spot for Brock until pick Where'd you have 16. him in your first mock field? It Brock was 16 Bowers. to the Seahawks. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, and I, I don't think that's, that, that's unfair to Brock, obviously. He's a better player than 16th on, you know, overall. It's just that quarterbacks, offensive tackles, and maybe wide receivers are going to push all these other guys at super important, but less important in the grand scheme spots down just a few notches. Let's go to picks 19 through 23, 24 here, Mel. Byron Murphy, the second from Texas, goes to the Rams. And that's, I'm going to ask you about that one because that is a new need for the Los Angeles Rams. The Steelers take Brian Thomas Jr., wide receiver from LSU. He ran only a 4 3 4, I don't know, six foot two, 200 pounds at the combine. Nothing to see there. Uh, Graham Barton, center guard, goes uh, to the Dolphins out of Duke, of course. He was a left tackle for his last three seasons with the Blue Devils. Lots of versatility there. The Eagles keep working on their secondary. They draft Nate Wiggins, cornerback out of Clemson. And then the Vikings, with this pick that they acquired from the Texans, get Cooper DeGene. I think you and I both feel like there's a real strong chance that 23rd pick is on the move with that number 11 pick to try to go further up the board. But for now, Minnesota has a chance to draft two premium starters. But let's just address Byron Murphy to the Rams here, Mel. Obviously a new need with Aaron Donald retiring. He is not Aaron Donald. Nobody is. But. The profile, which is similar to Aaron Donald, is an undersized yet very explosive defensive tackle. Yeah, the explosiveness didn't lead to nearly the production that Aaron Donald had. You do the, you put the numbers totally. up for the last three years of their respective careers. Donald yeah. at Pitt, Night and day. Byron Murphy, it's, it's not even close. It's like yeah. Aaron Donald did in a half a year what he did in his career. Right. But the talent, the potential is there. This is a leap of faith based on flashes that we saw. Instances we saw Byron Murphy II go out there and wreak some havoc and be disruptive. It was not on a consistent basis. And he had Tavondre Sweat right next to him. And he had a really good defensive front. So I didn't see the wowness, the wow factor play in and play out, game in and game out. I didn't see that Aaron Donald type. When he was at Pitt, and I went back and looked at all my notes from his, his career at Pitt and the games, I feel he didn't flash. He flashed every play. You know yeah. what he played? Every play he flashed. Yeah. It wasn't once in a while. I mean, Aaron Donald was as dominant a player in college as any you'll ever find. Well, the fact of the matter is, wow. at that particular time when he was drafted, it was the size. That's why yeah. he wasn't the first one of the first five players taken. He dropped into the middle of the first round area, close to the middle, right? Well, yeah, I think it was this kid, 12th, 14th, yeah. 12th overall. Yeah, almost the middle. So again, he didn't go top five. He should have gone right on top of the board because yeah. his production. Game in and game out. But this guy was unblockable. Byron Murphy the second was not unblockable game in and game out. So yep. the potential's there. The talent's there. Maybe the Rams do take a chance that we can coach him up. We can get what we saw in some games on a consistent basis, right? We can do that. And it makes sense if he drops down this far. Remember, the Raiders we talked about, but they have Christian Wilkins now. So yep. that pushes Byron Murphy off of the Raiders maybe to the Rams, and they, they take a Byron Murphy the second at that particular point of round one. So a lot of people responded to me when I hypothesized that the Steelers would be targeting a wide receiver at pick 20 after the Deontay Johnson trade. Well, hey, the Steelers don't use first-round picks on wide receivers because they just ace second and oftentimes third-round picks at wide receiver. Deontay Johnson, of course, being a third-round receiver himself. That being said, now. That's always easier said than done. Like, it's easy to say, like, you can just count on a second-round pick being highly effective. But the further you are away from pick number one, the more risk involved with the pick. Brian Thomas Jr., by the way, would be a hand-in-glove fit for a Steelers offense that now is going to be led by either Russell Wilson or Justin Fields. He had a monster 2023 season. He did, and I'll tell you what, uh, I thought about Xavier Worthy here because you have Pickens, yeah. and 
You had Worthy with that 4 2 1 speed who's dynamic. And I know you feel you screamed at me. He's 165 pounds, Mel. I get it. But he's, he's, a, he's a heck of a player. And guess what? He's a tough kid. He's not just a track guy with speed and all that. He's a football player. And I yeah. think it's going to be tough for Mike Tomlin, knowing you, that? Say, you have fields in there, to not take Xavier Worthy. But Brian Thomas Jr. is a town. He averaged 17 yards a catch, 17 touchdowns. Will he be there if he is? In Tampa Bay, there seems like that could, could go wide receiver. It's going to be interesting to see. But Xavier Worthy, I didn't feel good at pushing him down past this pick. I had it, scratched it, went to Brian Thomas Jr. So Worthy, to me, has to be in discussion when you're that fast and you're that good. Well, just like he was a speed guy. He was a heck of yeah. a player at Texas. He sure was. Yeah, he's got some toughness to him, as you have talked about in recent shows. That much is for sure about Xavier Worthy. Um, I wanted to just, before we move on to the next section of picks here, Mel, just uh, just a couple of thoughts from my own brain and then just your quick thoughts in reaction sure. to these. Uh, Cooper DeGene, uh, Iowa corner slash safety, but corner in college. Uh, I've talked to plenty of people about Cooper DeGene, and it get I get the general sense, Mel, that it's kind of a 50-50-ish split. Some people say, you know, he's a corner. Why would I not play him at corner? Others have said he has all the skills needed to be a safety. And because this is a weak safety class, he could be the first safety drafted by like 40 or 50 picks, depending on how high he goes, if he were to commit to be, or if a team were to say, we are taking you as a safety. Um, so I did think there's an interesting dynamic involved that a team has to decide upon, Mel. But where I decided to land was that I know when you're drafting a player, you do have to have a plan in mind. My idea is we'll just figure it out once we have him, right? Like he's good enough at corner that you could justify a top 25 pick on Cooper DeGene. And we're pretty darn sure he'd be good enough at safety to also justify that, that rather than being married to one position or the other, just get him in the building and figure it out. Do you feel the same about Cooper DeGene? Yeah, I think cornerback's the very underrated part of Cooper DeGene. He brings you a lot of versatility to whatever scheme he goes to, whatever defensive structure he goes to. And he has that ability, as you said, in a safety group that's underwhelming He's a number one safety. So, yep. again, Cooper DeGene is healthy through the process and finishes out the year and goes through and works out and does all these things. He's going higher than where we project him. But that's sure. the nature of the business. Where you don't have that, you have the injury, other guys move ahead. But he'll be a really good pick if he gets down into this late first-round area because of that versatility he has. And the fact that, I'll tell you what, from a consistency standpoint, he gives you punt return ability. Remember, he had that punt return call back when he would have beaten Minnesota when he said he had a, 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 a fair catch signal and they didn't allow the touchdown that would have beaten Minnesota. Uh, yeah. So, again, Cooper DeGene's a playmaker. He's reliable. He's been well. Kirk Ferentz and that Iowa staff do, and, and Parker, Norm Parker, do a great job. I mean, Phil Parker. Phil, Phil Parker, do a great yeah. job. Uh, getting these kids ready. Jack Campbell went in the middle of the first round for a reason, right? We've seen all these Iowa players, Lucas Van Ness, Riley yep. Moss, all these guys that played at Iowa. Now we go with Cooper DeGene, coach very well there with Phil Parker and Kirk Ferentz and that staff. So again, yep. he's NFL ready, and he is going to be a heck of a football player for somebody in that probably, what, 17, 18 to 32 range. He's somewhere in that area in terms of the mock projections. Key date for Cooper DeGene, uh, at least at last check on my end, was April 15th when he is expected to do a full workout now. He benched at the Iowa Pro Day last week. Maybe that was Monday. Every, every day seems to blend together these days. But whenever Iowa's Pro Day was, he did the bench press now, nothing else. Sounds like April 15th could be a target date, which, again, I think we all know he's plenty athletic. But this would only further verify just how athletic of a player Cooper DeGene is. All right, we'll rip through the last handful of picks here, Mel. Sure. We've got Layatu Latu going 25th. I'm sorry, I skipped the Cowboys at 24. Tyler Guyton, offensive tackle. Talk about a thin offensive line right now. Layatu Latu goes 25 to the Green Bay Packers. Xavier Worthy, your guy, goes to the Buccaneers at pick 26. And 27 is Chop Robinson. One more here, TJ Tampa going 28. That would be to Buffalo. So, uh, I, I want to dive into the Xavier Worthy pick here, Mel. And I think some people would see the Bucks taking a wide receiver and say, hold on now. They've got Mike Evans. They've got Chris Godwin. Mm -hmm. That seems like a pretty good starting point. Um, yes, it certainly is. And it's not like they need to take a wide receiver. But quietly, Chris Godwin is already back in a contract to your Mel. So uh, the, the draft is not just for what you need for this year, it is also what you need for future years, but that you consider an edge rusher or an interior offensive lineman here for the Buccaneers as well. 
I did, and it just got. To, I had to get Worthy off the board, and I thought about it it's exactly the way you said it. For the, another option in that passing game for Baker, obviously with Godwin's situation, you think about the future. You think about where we are with Worthy. I think he's going to be gone. I couldn't find a spot for him. That's the know, thing. Yeah. Into this whole need thing, and does it make sense? I can't see you, Xavier Worthy, getting down this far. If he does, I think you got to take him, and I think you got to look at the guard depth because there's a lot of guys you can pick up third, fourth, fifth round at that spot. Chop Robinson was the interesting yeah. one. And I didn't I mean, I like it about- at all field. I was, you know how you're, you're kind of like smacking yourself and wake up. Chop's not going to be there. And I kept trying to say, He's not I, gonna I, got be little, there. I got a few brew. I'm a little sore here a little bit from smacking yeah. myself enough about Chop Robinson. I, why am I dropping a kid who tested great, played yeah. really well, but didn't have the production, but he hustled, he sealed the edge. He did what they needed to do. He had the injury. And we met, so he would have had more production possibly. Oh, didn't have a sack in the first round. Chop yep. in a draft without great pass rushers outside of Dallas Turner. Latu has the neck injury, which we think will be fine, but that could push him down a little bit. Versus a little stiff in the hips, a little tightness in the hips, yep. but we like the the power, okay, the powerhouse yep, that Jared Verse yep. is. To me, Chop is going to go higher. I just didn't have a spot for him. You say, hey, how can you got to find a spot for a pass rusher? Field, it, it, it wasn't easy. And I, hard draft I dropped smell. down this where I did not feel comfortable dropping Chop Robinson down this where I do think he could go a little higher than this. All right, so Mel, this is one of my least favorite things that people do, and yet I'm going to do it myself right now. I don't have a spot for Chop Robinson, but I just firmly believe he's going higher than this, like you said as well. I think he might be a top 20 lock, Mel. Mm-hmm. Let me ask this question. And I'm not saying that I would draft it this way because, as you know, I'm a staunch layout to to fan and believer. Would you be stunned if the second edge rusher was Dallas Turner was first and then Chop Robinson was second? Not at all. And I almost Same. did that. Yeah. That's why I said I got back to saying, okay, you know what I always do when I, I have these problems and I'm tired of getting bruised and battered by myself? Right, I'm trying to beat myself up over this, as we all do. I mean, that's, that's what mock yeah. drafts are. They're to, I created this, or I can just beat themselves up over this stuff and create wreak havoc, right? Because they're sure. a pain. They really are. Mock drafts are a pain. Okay, yeah. and, and you know, the next day, they're as soon fun, as you though. do it, yeah. you fi- as soon as you file the daggone thing, a free yeah, agent is going to sign. Yeah, you know that course. it's inevitable, field inevitable yep. that somebody's going to or a couple teams going to make a move to say that in the need anymore. What are you, an idiot? So yep. again, were you crazy? So uh, I'm with you on that. That, that, that there's going to be somebody take him higher and it's just like you say i almost did it but i always said to myself and i think we do this and you have a i got mock 4.0 coming up i uh, know you <laughs> so got a chance to in, make it i don't right. know what the day is, sometime in april okay yeah. april 10th sometime i don't even april. know what the date yeah. is i have to check it that sounds right to me coming up yeah Hey, that's my final mock of the year. Not doing one in the morning of the draft. Not getting involved that's with that me. nonsense. Okay. Yeah. You, so pay, you, you said, hey, I'm going to take care of that. You take care of that. Oh, really? Yep. Hey, that's me now. Thank you. I'm happy. Oh, <laughs> they, I, I, I hit it the baton, baton, right? I hit it the baton. Bottom line is, yep. you, know, you look at where we are right now with Chop by 4.0 in a couple of weeks. Chop Robinson will probably be a little higher than this. Yeah. That's my general sense. That's my March 21st spider sense that he's going a lot higher than maybe. We are imagining him at times right now. I just, that kind of suddenness, that kind of natural pass rush ability. Yes, I acknowledge he did not turn it into sacks enough, but he is the, uh, you know, there's enough pressure generated, enough disruption oh, yeah. generated by Chop Robinson that he could be off the board, even with actually more modest length than I expected from Chop Robinson. I think he was like just around 6'2. I thought it could have been closer to 6'3. All right, final four picks here Lions go Xavier Leggett. Wide receiver, South Carolina. Ravens go Marius Mims. They need obviously offensive tackle help. Right tackle from Georgia. And here's one I want to ask you about in a second. Roger Rosengarden, offensive tackle from Washington, going 31 overall. And the Chiefs wrap things up with A.D. Mitchell. So I'm going to go in reverse order here, Mel, because sure. uh, I know you don't bother reading the comments or spending time on the internet to see what people are saying about your mock draft. But the name that surprised the most people making it into the first round was Roger Rosengarden, who you and I have talked about. We feel like, you know, has he's day two lock for sure. Maybe even round two lock, maybe closer to the end of round two. Now you've got him at the end of round one. Do you think this is really going to be a sort of a catapult for Roger Rosengarten to potentially be like a top 31, 35, 40 pick? This was a wake everybody up and get all those bad comments and get yep. ripped on the internet. And, yeah. and it was, it Just was, it was like a it. stunt. I'll admit it was a stunt. Okay. But it was okay. a, 
it was a stunt where there's method to the madness. Okay. Mm, yeah. And yeah. I don't just throw things out there for no reason. And I almost did another thing in the mock. I, you know, and I've heard Ro Roger Rosengarten from people, and we all have our friends in the National Football League, yeah. right? And somebody's whispering a little bit. There's little whispers of Roger Rosengarten. So just yeah. keep that in mind, all the haters out there, and I, which I don't even know who you are. I don't know what you said, but I'm sure you're hating on me a little bit. <laughs> keep it coming. Keep no it coming. one hates That's the God. That's right. I almost did yeah. something even more, stat I guess it would be, what's the word? More shocking? Uh, okay, what would it in be? Terms of Rod if Roger Rosengarten was a shocker, I'll give you another one. I almost okay. did this, and I may do it in 4.0 just to get more hate going. But this kid's okay. a heck of a football player. He has one hell of a football player, is Mohamed Kamara. Pass wow. from Colorado State. This kid, the more I watch him, this isn't from people in the league. This is from my this eyes watching this kid all year, going back and watching him, looking at Joey Porter. Not junior, the original Joey Porter. Great player, Colorado State, third-round pick the Steelers. And also Shaq Barrett. Undrafted okay. out of Colorado yeah, State of course, after a yeah. heck of a career, this kid get and it, hey, I've heard I've heard the third round projections. I've heard them. Yeah. I see them. I know what's out there. Okay, third round for Muhammad Kamara. If he's in the third round, steal. It's gonna be. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Muhammad Kamara is one of those players we're gonna look back on three to four years from now and say, why didn't he go a lot higher? Because this kid's one heck of a pass rusher. Yeah, he ran really well at the combine. You know, he's a shorter edge rusher, which is always going to lead to that. Yeah, but, but that's going to lead to the conversation and the debate. Can you draft an edge rusher who's got that sort of build without? And Remember he has got Dwight Freeney. Very, of course, yeah, I mean, of course, for sure, yeah. Um, but you know, this is good athleticism. It's not elite like Chop Robinson, who I just mentioned has not exactly the longest pass rusher as well. All right, so I we've gotten through a lot of picks your mail. The last one that I wanted to close on here is one that. I might have to steal for Mach 2.0 because Xavier Leggett to the Lions feels borderline perfect. Now, they could use an, another edge rusher. They could certainly use some more cornerback help, and that might be firmly in play. But I was thinking about this, and this does not apply to, I guess, every player on the roster. But doesn't it feel like maybe as much as any team in the NFL, the Lions have a type of player they target, a guy who's physical, tough selfless, the kind of player who would do anything that is asked of him. And that, to me, is kind of the story of Xavier Leggett. You can point to the fact that he's a one-year wonder at South Carolina. I'll point to the fact that when he wasn't getting a ton of reps at wide receiver early in his career, he was playing on the punt return team, or he was running as the gunner or covering kicks, you name it, doing whatever was asked of him. I'm all in on Xavier Leggett at 6'1", 220 pounds. We're in a 4'3940 at the combine now. Maybe your best pick. I just wanted to get that off my chest. I know you're a big fan of Leggett as well. What was his vertical? Around 40? Um, yeah, 40 you know, inches. Yeah. yeah. Like Xavier Leggett. Premium athlete. Uh, yeah. I mean, he put it all together and he had, he was a great kick return. Remember his kick return numbers? Yeah. When you were 30 yards a kick return. So yep. uh, this kid, like I say, waited his turn, did it, put it all together for the Lions, catch the daggone football at critical moments. Yeah. And they, yeah, that's where Adonai Mitchell, too, at Kansas City. What, what hurt Kansas City? Didn't hurt him too much. He won a Super Bowl. Drops, but what was hurting yeah. him? Drops. Adonai Mitchell, you brought it up, Phil. You know, look at one. Thing. One drop all year? One all year. So th that's a guy who's, you know, with his size over 6'3. Now he's got to get a little stronger. He can add a little yeah. weight. He's got to get a little stronger. So there's things to work on for Adonai Mitchell, but catching the football for Patrick Mahomes would not be a problem. And for Xavier nope. Leggett, same thing for Jared Goff. So I, I think at that point, you can't add to what you have already and take, I wouldn't say it's a luxury pick. Now, the other, I, you haven't mentioned my stunt from a few mocks ago, which was TJ Tampa. No, I mean, you're in on this one. You like okay, it. You're okay with TJ Tampa. I, I think it's a little higher than where he'll end up for me. Yeah. But what I will say, Mel, is that there is a, I don't think it's a dramatic dip to the point that the corners are no longer draftable, but we go from a point where the cornerback class starts to fall off and becomes much more slot corner heavy, right? You've got a bunch of guys, Mikey Sandra still from Michigan, yeah. Daquan Hardy from Penn State. I mean, you've got five, you know, you've got smaller pint sized corners that you just wouldn't trust on the outside. So those guys probably aren't going to end up being, you know, top 50 or so selections. So I do think there's a chance that DJ Tampa and a recovering Kool-Aid McKinstry and Kamari Lassiter and Ennis Rankstraw all end up being, you know, top 40 to 45 picks just because Max Melton as well from Rutgers, who I've certainly talked about plenty of times on this show, Mel, just because at some point the perimeter corner starts to really dry up or you get into like 
different styles of player, right? A Cam Hart from Notre Dame, a big physical type of corner, but maybe a little bit less loose in the hip, not the kind of guy that you want to have working as much laterally. So once that drop-off hits, it's going to obviously impact the way the rest of the board shapes up. So I think the guys like TJ Tampa could artificially rise a little bit as a result of it. Yeah, no doubt. I think as a football player, I love what I saw. Yeah, well, I was tough, eight, long. Yeah, under the radar, cyclones, wide receiver, corner, the players rave about him, coaches. You know, I mean, to me, as a player, and I, you talk about the injuries and the, the pro days and the speed and all the things that go into it, some guys are moving down just a bit at that spot. He's one that nobody feels. I would say there's silent. Crick, I don't hear any TJ Tampa. Do you hear any TJ Tampa talk? None. I don't. None. I don't remember hearing his name from anybody. I've yeah, had him, no, I bad just or good, right? Player. I mean, it's a corner yeah. with his length, his yeah. consistency, his anticipation, his awareness, former receiver. He's a worker. He comes to work every day, business-like approach. I don't know what's not to like. I, I mean, I, I really don't. I think TJ Tampa to me, there's, I guess, silence isn't always golden. I, I don't get that. I don't know. I mean, maybe on draft day, as long as you, you get your name called on draft day, who cares about the other stuff? But TJ Tampa is way under the radar in terms of what type of player he is. Yeah, he. Uh, one of my favorite games to watch, Mel, actually favorite and least favorite is this, is the Kansas State-Iowa State game late in the season when there was about a foot of snow on the field is simultaneously one of my favorite and least favorite games to watch. It's, it's impossible to identify numbers in that game, especially on the team that was wearing white jerseys, which I'm pretty sure was Kansas State. But it's also a great game to watch because there's nothing better than football on a foot of snow. Uh, but TJ Tampa, yeah, he brought it consistently for that Iowa State defense. Certainly very impressed with the uh, the length there and the on-ball disruption, right? Because if he's in the vicinity, Mel, you know he's going to get his hands on the football with those long go-go gadget arms. So TJ Tampa makes it into the first round of Mach 3.0 for the second straight mock. Uh, but there you have it, Mel. That was a lot of fun, as always. I know you love doing those mock drafts. I know you can't wait for April 10th or next one. But in the meantime, you get to pick on me because I get my mock 2.0. Yeah, 2.0. I guess 2.5 because I did the mini mock as well. But my next two-round mock comes out on April 3rd, Mel. Already can't wait for that. Uh, but in the meantime, we are back. Well, I am back in a week on Thursday, Mel. Daniel Dopp is one last time in my seat this upcoming Monday. Daniel, you did a great job last time. I know you're going to do a great job again this time. But, Mel, enjoy a wonderful weekend. I'm going to go back and reread your mock draft 100 times to get me ready five weeks forward from tonight. The draft begins in Detroit. Cannot wait. I'll talk to you soon, my friend. And guess what, Field? With, with Daniel Dopp on Monday, there's a cornerback that nobody's talking about that we would be talking about on Monday. By the wow. way, wow! Ooh, we call that a tease in the industry, my friends. I uh, can't wait. We'll find out who that cornerback is. Until then, we'll talk to you guys all soon here on First Draft.